Howdy folks, it's Bob Paxton and here's our Green Spirit Nature Walk. I'm uh, out at Circle about two weeks before uh, Green Spirit, so middle of July. The vegetation that you'll see is uh, largely the same that you would see at Green Spirit. Um, you know, give or take a couple of weeks. It's not not uh, really all that different, but um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the land and what it is and what it is not. Um, Circle Sanctuary is 200 acres. Used to be a dairy farm, uh, as you may have guessed from the farmhouse and the barn. Uh, Circle acquired the land in the early 80s. Um, the uh, history around that is kind of interesting. Um, you know, you think of Wisconsin as the dairy state. And the, the big reason was in the beginning what was happening down here in the southwestern corner, the, the driftless region of the state. Um, you know, early on uh, in Wisconsin's history, you could do just fine as a dairy farmer on land like this. You didn't need a lot of machinery or, uh, you know, advanced infrastructure to pull off having a reasonable dairy operation. Um, by the 70s and 80s, early 80s, um, those of you who were paying attention to the news at that point probably heard about the dairy crisis. Uh, the dairy crisis was really where the model of these small family-owned farms with cattle uh, pasturing, you know, kind of off here and there, uh, became ineffective. It didn't you know, it, it couldn't compete anymore with the larger mechanized operations. So this land had lain fallow for a few years. Um, house was in disrepair, the barn was marginal, and at the time that Circle was looking to uh, move into having a permanent place of its own, um, it just so happened that land like this was available for a song. So that's one part of the thing, right? It's, it's a nature preserve. Uh, and over the 40 years that Circle has held the land, our understanding of what nature preserve means has evolved greatly. Um, in the beginning, for a good long while, uh, the idea was, well, you just let nature do what nature's going to do. You don't, uh, you know, you don't go out of your way to disturb things. You don't cut trees. You don't um, seed things. You don't really change the nature of any of these spaces. And that worked out all right for a couple decades um, for reasons that nobody really understood which was that you can do that just fine if you're coming off of a stretch where land had um, been tended and uh, the natural uh, flora, you know, had been suppressed to some degree, uh, which I know is counterintuitive, but Here's the thing, before the European invasion, um, Circle, th this land, this region, was what they called a fire ecology. For several thousand years, the best estimate I've seen is about 6,000 years, the Native Americans deliberately and frequently set understory fires which were not intense enough to, you know, go up into the crowns of trees and really burn those down, but did keep the land fairly open underneath. And in doing so, 
it, there was a balance that was created over those millennia of, uh, you know, between the plants and the native animals. Um, you know, a lot of this was just prairie land. And I shouldn't say just prairie land because prairies are fantastically diverse. And uh, we've got a fair amount of uh, restored prairie here on the land that, uh, you know, maybe we'll get up to. Depends how much time I spend talking. So, when the European invasion happened, one of the first major changes that took place was fire suppression. People did not burn the land the way they used to. So those thousands of years of history of, you know, habits, you could say, that the land had developed, that was suddenly broken. And as a consequence, uh, things got a little out of balance. And we see some of that here. Um, for example, let me just kind of reach out here. This is grapevine. It's native to the area. It's not uh, an unexpected thing to find here. Uh, the thing about grapevine, though, is that it will climb and kill whatever tree happens to be unfortunate enough to act as scaffolding for it. And you can see that up here a little bit. Um, send fire through, the grapevine just kind of keeps, uh, you know, down to a reasonable balanced level. Don't send fire through or don't do work to actively push back on it. And you get these grand thickets that aren't really much good to anything. Um, you know, neither uh, people nor animals can really do much with it. It's, you know, victory for grapevines at the cost of everything else. So that's one part of it. The other part is that as the European invasion continued, we brought certain plants that didn't really belong here and didn't really have anything to natively keep it in check. Um, and I'll point out some of that as we get a little bit closer to it. Um, oh, here we go. This stuff right here. This is this is multiflora rose. Um, yes, it does. It, it is a true rose. It makes um, uh, lovely flowers. Um, uh, the birds just adore it. It's it's great. But it was put here in the 30s by the USDA as a means of making natural hedges. And then we discovered. Uh, much to our chagrin, that it doesn't stay put. The birds will eat the rose hips and liberally distribute the, the seeds here, there, and everywhere. And you can see a little bit, not real closely, but you can see a bit of the thorns. As these really grow up, they create impenetrable thickets of just un, you know, unsuitable Space that that nothing else that should be living here can grow in. Um, and then let's also be realistic. Circle is, in addition to a nature preserve, a uh, functioning pagan church. And if you've seen pagans going around at festival, you know we uh, you know we like our flowy skirts and our sarongs and our kilts. And, and this is no damn good when you've got flowy skirts and sarongs and kilts. So this is something that we actively have to suppress in order to uh, maintain some balance. Fire helps with that. This is one of my favorite little quieter spots down here at Circle. Um, the stream, you know, if you, you you've seen or know about Brigid Spring, 
um, really all of the streams, all of the springs at Circle, all of the land drains down into this. And where, you may ask, does this go? Uh, this joins other streams in the vicinity. And uh, about 15 miles north of here, uh, winds up in the Wisconsin River um, between Mesomany and Spring Green. And from there down to the Mississippi, and from the Mississippi down to the Gulf of Mexico. So... The next time you find yourself uh, up here and dipping your hand in the stream, just know that this water is joining all of the waters of this whole region and going down to the sea. There is a direct link from the sea all the way up here. Hi, Bun Bun. Don't mind me. We're cool. And here we're at the edge, one edge of Circle's uh, wetland. Um, it's a deliberate choice that we've made to keep this wetland. Um, you probably heard the water rushing back here. It, we actually have a little um, uh, masonry step and gate to uh, keep the water up at a certain degree to always keep this wet. Um, we could drain it and we would lose tremendous diversity and ecological value if we did so. Um, I, you can't overstate how much value a wetland provides to everything around it. Um, among other things, um, you can't really keep bats um, and thereby keep the insects down without having some wetland and constant water for them. So here's another one of these problematic species. Um, these are the upper tendrils of ground nut. Um, it is a genuine tuber. It's native to the area. Um, I understand they're pretty tasty. They're sort of uh, uh, between a potato and more of a nutty peanut uh, flavor. They were very important to the Native Americans as a protein source. Um, and if left unchecked, you see they do the same viney thing the grapevines do and really bring everything else around it low. Uh, we have a tamarack grove up off that away that we're constantly pushing back the uh, ground nut with. Milkweed, Queen Anne's lace. Tall willows over here. There's that angelica I was thinking about right here. Yeah, this stuff. So this is a native. Um, it's a very fragile plant, really. This is not, uh, it, the stem is uh, hollow, not very strong. Um, I just adore it. I, I, it's one of those things I don't have a great reason to you know, it's, it's just sort of a, eh, you know, wetland sort of thing, but gosh, I just love, 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 love Angelica.
before or after? Near before. So these are true blackberries that are not yet ready to go by a few weeks. Um, as opposed to the uh, black raspberries or black caps that uh, peaked about two weeks ago. Now, both of them grow in similar locations on the, the edges of clearings. And here we see the tamaracks. These were planted here over the span of some years. We've got probably 20 of them scattered around through here. Um, they are native. They are not well suited to fire. Um, but uh, that's okay. Not everything has to burn. We've been keeping this moan. Must have flushed out a deer there. We're keeping this moan for good reason. Um, even though, you know, there is this plague and we're not having events out on the land. Um, part of it is that if you don't, it will overgrow and you're going to have to work that much harder to bring it back. Part of it is that being in a, you know, an old dairy farm in, you know, rural Wisconsin, um, if it looks derelict, uh, random kids or passers-by uh, will tend to treat it accordingly. And part of it is that we've put in too much work over the years to just retreat and let it all come undone. There are a lot of these rock faces here at Circle. Go far enough back, and this was the floor of an ocean. The main stone under things is calcite. And you'll see these different colors in here. You'll have some red iron. You'll have some, well, that green is lichen. If you look up further there to the greener area, there's some copper deposits. And then you've got the darker brown, which gets into manganese. one of my favorite little spaces on the land. Doesn't see a lot of use, or visitation rather. It's not hard to get to if you are uh, sufficiently interested and capable of walking just a little bit off of the mown path.
very bones of the earth. This is why we want you here, folks. We want you to experience this. We want you to call to your gods and goddesses as they manifest in this. The day will come soon when you can come do this again. Here are some of the finest old oaks on the land up this hill. These are older than the time the Europeans were here. Likely enough, older than the United States. We're gonna keep them. That's why we're here. And just to help you orient here, we came from off that away, so the main road to come in is over there. The stream is all down here and along out the land. On the other side of the stream, where you see things kind of open up, that's Meadowvale. That's the camping area. We are right now a little past the big round festival circle. Just to orient you, none of this stuff is very far away if you uh, take a little bit of time and just walk into the woods to come get it. Oh man. So this is what I mean about the grapevine. This is a fine old oak that the grapevine has choked and choked and choked. Yeah, there we go. Another one of those things I adore. This time of year, that whole hillside is full of coneflowers, black-eyed Susans. stand of Aspen up there doing its thing. If 
Fun fact. When you see aspen like this, this cluster all together, it's one organism. Genetically, it's all one thing. We refer to them as aspen clones. It's one of those early harbingers of the forest to come. Uh, comes up first when uh, there's been a major disruption of the land. As trees go, they're... Eh. Oh, hi there. They're not particularly long-lived, but uh, they fulfill their niche. They provide important ground cover and habitat to get going early. Well, all right, so um, this is where we're going to leave off for this segment of the Nature Walk. I'm going to head back and uh, put a battery in the camera and head out toward, uh, head out down the other side of the stream off that away. And these are morning glories, which I like them. They don't belong. They too are invasive, but they're not extremely invasive. They uh, do the viney thing, but they tend not to choke everything around it. Not every invasive is bad. Or rather, not every invasive poses a problem that we have to do something about right now or this year or this decade. Now here, here, this guy here, that is wild parsnip. It has a compound in its sap that if you get it on your skin and there's sunlight exposure, will give you the worst and longest lasting burn. It is just unbelievably painful and will often leave a permanent mark. That's an invasive that we do our level best to keep under control. That's pretty terrible stuff. There's the remnants of a bridge that should be about 50 yards up the stream that way. We've got our bright ideas and uh, the stream has its own. Right, here we are on the second portion of the nature walk. Now that I've got a fresh battery. And to orient you, where we went prior was down and around and across some ways out, all on that opposite side. See that hill up there? That's 
where that stone outcropping was that we went up to. This is all camping space up here. There are some flat areas cut in. Interesting idea to point out to you folks. So there's a an idea in geology called angle of repose. And the angle of repose is for any given soil or rock or combination of, of, uh, of earth, there is a steepness past which it can't sustain. It will over time erode and shift down to be a little bit flatter until it makes that angle of repose. This area over here we cut back a little while ago uh, to get some fill for another project and also to push parking space back. And you see how it's kind of collapsed, cracked in right here? This excavation exceeded the angle of repose for this mixture of these loamy clay soils with the uh, uh, included uh, stones. You can increase angle of repose by uh, planting, uh, you know, ground cover on it. That's, you know, reducing erosion. Uh, you can do it mechanically with mats and that sort of thing. Or uh, if you're folks like us who um, have other things to do, and just wait and let it sort itself out. Another nice stand of sumacs here. Ooh, nice big turkey feather. Check this out. Ah. I'm going to keep that one with me. We have a fair number of wild turkeys here at Circle. They can fly, by the way, they just don't really want to. And here's the old Selena van. And this hickory is sorely vexed by grapevine too. So there's a little something we're going to want to fix because hickory and oak are two species we are definitely biased toward out here. This section over here on this side from this road down is what we call Unit 4 or the Dennis Presser Memorial Oak Savannah. Uh, Oak Savannah is one of the uh, small native systems that belongs in this area, consisting of widely spaced oaks, like you see here, with relatively low ground cover beneath it. There are species that grow here and birds that will nest here that you don't find anywhere else on the land. They really need this, this kind of uh, uh, lightly wooded habitat. You know, one of the things about being spiritually rooted in a place like this is, you know, a lot of pagan folk will become attached to a specific spot or a specific tree or what have you and when they can't go there anymore or the tree falls down it's it's a big deal. Uh, the nice thing about a piece of land like this is if you find yourself attached to a fine old oak and something happens to it, 
um, walk 20, 30 yards and there's another. The spirit of oak, the, the essence of oakness is plenty, plenty easy to find. And what we're looking at down here is the spiral labyrinth. Um, this has been here for uh, 11, 12 years. We keep it up uh, because we need you to know that when you come back here, this will be here waiting for you. If you look up and across where I was uh, up in that field of black-eyed Susans, that's all just right up there. That's where all of that was that I was walking. And here we're getting to the prairies. Um, some of what's in this prairie is remnant from when, you know, it was, uh, you know, pre-European. The section up here is largely new and reseeded. There was a project around, I think, 99 that it began to, uh, where we put down black plastic for a couple of years to suppress everything that was there, all of the European pasture grasses. And then we reseeded it with, you know, some stuff that was uh, purchased and some stuff that came from remnant prairies uh, elsewhere here in southwestern Wisconsin. Uh, and we've, over time, seeded some of that out into here as well. So. Here we've got your purple coneflower, Echinacea. This is native, it belongs. Turkey vulture. Here we've got some of the, this is a, a silphium, I'm not sure which one. It could be prairie dock, it could be, well, probably not compass plant. Um, we do have a reasonable, we've got three or four different silphiums here on the, the land, and these are really historically significant. They, you know, you've, you've really kind of arrived as a prairie if you've got a self-sustaining population of those. Aldo Leopold, St. Aldo, was very, very fond of silphiums. And Stone Circle is up there. And you go down and over the other side of the saddle. That's the cremains part of the cemetery, and that clearing is the full body part of the cemetery, all up across there. Circle owns a fully permitted green cemetery. Uh, we've been doing that for a good period of time. Um, We need to care for every phase of life. And having a place up the hill that we can go when that time comes is, we believe, very important to pagan society. So yeah, when we talk about the prairie, around circle. This 
this is what we're talking about. This section here and this grand field here. Seems quiet and peaceful, but it's a very, very busy place. The wild indigo has gone to seed already, and now it's just in its later vegetative state. I should remember who these guys are, but I don't. All right. And here we're heading into Carnunos Glen. It's one of the finer oak stands we've got on the land. Those of you who uh, know me or follow me on Facebook know I'm not really much for um, speculating beyond the evidence or, uh, you know, talking about the divine in grand terms. I'm not really much of a theist by nature. But I will tell you, the Kernunos I've met there is as real to me as the tree. And the Brigid that I've met down at Brigid Spring is as real to me as the sand and the bubbling water. Which is not to say I expect you to think the same way. But I will say that if you're looking for something to get in touch with, you could do a lot worse than to find yourself a place like this and still yourself and wait to see what comes naturally. Another reason we keep these lanes mown is as fire breaks because we do do prescribed fire across this whole open section. That is an important part of keeping this in the pre-European invasion balance. thing about restoration. You, um, once you dig far enough into it, you realize that you're not 
really looking for a single gold standard what should nature be you're really finding yourself choosing which nature you want to be where we have a lot of blackberries this year well, some of them are almost there how are we doing with this one no not yet I wish I could describe to you how amazing it smells right here. Um, it's just so rich and full of life. Up that path is Transformation Ridge. It's a pretty hefty hike in and around and up to the top there. I'm not going to take you in there right now um, it's been a we, we went through some efforts a couple years ago to open a road into there and uh, ran out of time that season and uh, haven't really come back to it we'll get there someday as uh, thickly wooded as this is uh, the ridge is kind of best um, in uh, the springtime before things have really blossomed out. Tick trefoil here. Pretty little flowers. Um, they get kind of irritating late in the season. They form these little green pods that, uh, as you walk past them, will stick to you just unbelievably tenaciously. They're native. They've got their place. By the way, everything you've been looking at here, all of this, this is all circle land. And it's not all of circle land by any means. Um, it extends quite some distance off that away and all across here. And certainly up that slope and over and out. Now here's some good stuff here. Just to orient you, we're at the far corner of the prairie. The stream is there. Here's this crab apple tree. For reasons I do not understand, there's a no parking sign. This is still circle land, I hasten to remind you.
This is one of my favorite little hidey holes on the land. The land does extend some distance off that way yet. And a good distance up there, and modestly up there as well. Keep going far enough, and there, you know, you'll run into the fence line, and that's roughly where the land ends. This is a good, quiet, remote place. Thunder off in the distance. That's all right. We'll be back well before that shows up. Okay. And here we are back at that corner of the prairie. Word of warning if you find yourself out here. There is barbed wire still strung there that we've never managed to get out. It's very steep. So this right here is not really the place you want to be heading downhill to get get into the spring or the stream. Some angelica past its bloom. That way is north, just to orient yourself. I know this because I have a cell phone that will tell me this. Out here in the prairie, the soil type is considered a silty loam. It is fantastically fertile stuff. And it uh, tends to stay put. It's a little bit sticky, but uh, gosh, just wonderful, wonderful earth. There are other places on the land where we have clay deposits, uh, especially along the stream and uh, up toward the house. And then as you get toward the top of some of these um, ridges, you get into more sandy soils. Just to orient yourself, the uh, stone circle is up there. The cemetery is kind of off over there. 
and we went all the way around to here. Back this way where we're headed is uh, down Meadowvale past the spiral labyrinth and through the camping area that many of you have had the pleasure of camping in at festivals in years gone past. And we'll have the pleasure of camping in in years to come. Rest you assured of that. Yeah, definitely storm coming. So there's the entrance to the spiral labyrinth. I'm just going to go all the way around it here because with that storm coming I don't really want to spend extra time going boop, boop, boop in just to go boop, boop, boop back out. Orient yourself again. Up there is that uh, um, ridge with the rock outcropping that we stopped at early on. Up there is Stone Circle and behind that the cemetery. Out there is the prairie. You can see the barn here. Brigid Spring is just around the corner with the fire circle on the other side of the stream up there. We've done some work this year on opening up the understory around Brigid Spring and taking down dead trees and getting the ground nut off those tamaracks and you know just keeping it a nice place to go to. Here's where the big uh, ritual circle bonfire typically is. Got plenty of brush and wood across here for next year's fires. Sorry about disturbing you. Oh, there's another damn brown hog. All right, and here we are back at the Maypole and uh, Thank you for joining me on this uh, nature walk and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the programming for today and feel free to uh, come back and re-watch this on Circle Sanctuary's YouTube channel for uh, as many years to come as, uh, as you'd like. Take care folks.